Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery of the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Our call to worship. Let us pray. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far along the way, thou who has by thy might led us into thy light, keep us forever in the path we pray. God, we come thanking you for how you've kept us, how you've walked with us on this path called life each and every day that you've afforded us each new day, we know that you've been there by our side. And God, we do not dare take it for granted because the truth is, if it had not been for you walking with us, talking with us, we have no idea where we would be. So God, we thank you for this day, for this day in which we come to honor you and worship you in spirit and in truth. God, I pray that something that is said and is done on today somehow, some way offers you the, the gratitude of praise worthy of your name and due to you just simply based on who you have been. And that's God and God alone. God, on today, I pray that you be with this preacher, God. Give him a double blessing of, of strength, power, and favor so that he can stand boldly to proclaim what thus saith the Lord. I pray that the words that you've given him transforms and touches the hearts and mind of someone tuning in on today. Someone tuned in today, God, I pray that you touch them in a way that speaks to them so that the words that you've given your preacher resonates with them, that encourages them, that says no matter what is going on in their life, that they can continue to journey on. God, we thank you for all that you've done throughout this week. We thank you for how you've kept us. We thank you that even in the midst of the city called Philadelphia, where gun violence is, is raging and ramping up, God, that you still are on the throne. So, God, I pray for those families who've been affected by crime and gun violence. I pray for our elected officials. I pray for our elected officials at the city level, at the state level, and federal level, that they actually take a stance and, and do something that can minimize and curtail the gun violence in our city. God, I pray for those who are dealing with loss of life, loss of job or just other areas of loss that we don't even know about. I pray that you encourage them and strengthen them and walk with them and give them what they need. Pray that you allow your peace to catch up and surpass their understanding. Pray for that man, that woman, that boy, that girl who's wrestling with thoughts that only they know about. Touch their mind, God. Give them peace. Give them serenity. Give them stability for such a time as this. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, again, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I'm delighted that you're worshiping with us today for our virtual mountain experience. And what will be our last formal virtual uh, complete virtual experience as we are preparing to return back to in-person worship in a modified capacity. A lot of that information will be forthcoming. Um, there's going to be a letter that will be mailed out to the entire congregation. Some will have the letter mailed to them. Some will receive it electronically via email. But the information will still be the same, outlining and detailing the information that is necessary to return back to in-person worship. There are some, some modifications. Things will look differently when we return, not just because we're trying to be different, but because we had to modify 
the format of service. We have to modify the amount of time we are going to spend here in the space called sanctuary. And so I'm asking and I'm soliciting your prayers in advance that when we have to make adjustments, that you understand that it's not just because we didn't have anything else to do. We're making the best adjustments with the information we have to ensure that when we return to in-person worship, that everyone is safe. I will tell you that in order to return to worship, masks are required and vaccinations are required. Again, please hear me, Mount Carmel and friends and family. It's not to exclude individuals. We're just trying to err on the side of caution and make sure that those individuals, members and guests who will be in this sanctuary are safe. That's our primary goal at this time is to ensure safety for everyone who will be worshiping with us, not only virtually, but also in person. There's going to be a phone number available for individuals who cannot use the electronic method of registration because you will have to register each and every week for our in-person worship. There will be a phone number designated for you to call. That phone number is different than the church's main number. We will not be calling the main number to register for worship. Again, we will not be utilizing the church's main telephone number to register. All of that information will be made available via our website, Facebook page, and other platforms, as well as a robocall will go out with that information, as well as a complete letter detailing all the details of worship and registering for in-person worship. Mount Carmel. It has not been easy. I can assure you for the past 20 months, it has not been easy. And as your pastor, I've been making the best decisions through prayer and discernment by the leader of the Holy Spirit, along with the leadership and officers of the church, that we make the best decisions as we do what's best for Mount Carmel Baptist Church. I thank you in advance for your prayers and your cooperation and your commitment to as we move closer and closer to us all soon, I pray, to return back to in-person worship. But don't worry, the pandemic has taught us that our virtual worship and our virtual members, they aren't going anywhere. So we will continue to stream, we will continue to do both in-person and stream all of our worship services moving forward. I thank you for all that you've done. I thank you for all of your prayers and your continued commitment because we have only made it this far by the grace of God and your continued individual and collective support and commitment. So I thank you in advance. Mount Carmel, in the words of Reverend Woodson, it's preaching time. It's preaching time. It's preaching time. So after our hymn of preparation, the next voice you will hear will be that of our executive minister, Reverend Kenneth L. Woodson, hear ye him, it's preaching time. A thief lay dying on a cross. And he knew all along that he had done wrong. And now for his sin, he must die. But as he turned, he saw the Christ. With his blood flowing down, he knew he had found the one who could save his soul. So he cried, remember me when you come into your kingdom, oh Lord. Remember me when you talk to your father and tell him that I know I've not been all he wants me to be, but in mercy now I believe. Remember 
of me. Then Jesus said, have no shall be with me eternally it is for you that I've died and now I know Christ he lives again stands all alone before the white throne with his own righteous life he covers mine so now I cry remember me when you Tell him that I know I've not been all he wants me to be. So in mercy now I plead, Lord, please remember. Be merciful to me, O oh God, be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. Good morning, Mount Carmel. We're just so happy to be here today, and we just thank you for being part of this service. Those of you who are new to us, we again welcome you to this Mount Carmel virtual worship experience. We'd love to hear your response, your comments as to what you've experienced. Please leave us a note in our comment sections on your uh, social media platforms, and get in touch with us. We'd love to be able to communicate with you. I want to begin by thanking uh, Pastor Moore for this opportunity to share a word. You know, it's, it's no small thing to stand and proclaim. Uh, when you're sitting, watching, and when you're listening, it's difficult to really appreciate what the preacher is dealing with. There's sort of driving through a storm, countervailing winds, and you're constantly trying to navigate. But you've been called by God to speak a word. So today we're going to speak a word. And pray that God will take this feeble attempt at edifying and magnifying the word that the Lord has placed on my heart. So again, I also want to thank all of those who, members of my family who may be viewing from various parts of the country. Uh, particularly my mother 
who was in Buffalo, New York, and my brothers who are from various parts of the world and the country, and uh, family who are in uh, the military, etc. Thank you all for being part of this. A special shout out uh, to my goddaughter, my first goddaughter, and newly appointed and sworn Sergeant Woodson, Tasha Woodson, now promoted to Sergeant Erie County Sheriff's Department. That's just a little personal privilege, Pastor. Uh, needed to take. Um, today, some of you, particularly our members, you may be noticing I'm wearing a, a colorful robe today. This is my special preaching robe. I only wear this on special occasions. And today for me is a special occasion. This is, as the pastor has said, is the final day of our totally virtual worship experience. Next Sunday, the first Sunday of November, Lord willing, we will, many of us will be sitting in the pews, the rostrum will be populated by the ministerial staff, and we will be able to worship together. But this is the close of an era. This is the close of a phase of uh, our response to the pandemic. So it was important to me that we had an opportunity to just note that for the record, that we're moving to a new way of worshiping post-pandemic. Our post-pandemic experience will not be what the pre-pandemic experience was. We will be in a completely different mode. So I'm prayerful that you will continue to hang in there with us and that you will be part of this new plan that the Lord has laid on the pastor's heart. And it was important. Pastor can't pastor. He can't lead unless we're willing to follow. And so it's important that we do what we've been asked to do. And so today, I'm preaching to an empty sanctuary, <laughs> but it is filled with the presence of the Lord. Yeah, yeah. And so we're just going to lean on that and work through that. Our scripture lesson for this morning, for today's service, can be found in the Old Testament, book of Micah, 6th chapter, verses 1 and 2 and 6 through 8. I will read from the NRSV translation, verse 1. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. Verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love and kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Let us pray. Lord, it's preaching time. Lord, it's preaching time. It's preaching time. Lord, grant me the power and clarity of speech to deliver the message that you placed on my heart. Lord, take away my fears, my anxiety, and help me to deliver a message that will speak to the hearts of your people. A message that will deliver hope in hopeless situations. A message that will shine light into dark spaces. A message that will draw men and women unto you. Lord, bless your people. Lord, bless your people. Lord, bless your people. Amen? It's preaching time. For today's sermon, I really, although I'll be preaching from that, the book of Micah total, I will focus most of what I have to deliver on the uh, eighth verse, which reads as follows. He has told you, O mortal. What is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? What does the Lord require of you? Amen. What does the Lord require of you, O mortal? The Lord has told you. What does the Lord require? Pastor, I believe that the morals of this country are in serious decline. It is clear to me that we have lost our moral compass. The evidence of moral decay is all around us. 
I'm not so much referring to our individual or private moral code, such as our individual positions on controversial topics such as sexual identity, contraception, or whether a woman should have the right to choose an abortion. No, no, I'm talking about our collective morality, our public morality, a term that I borrowed from an op-ed prepared by Robert Reich, published in the Eurasian Review on October 26, 2021. Robert Reich is a professor of public policy at the University of California at Berkeley. He also served as the Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration. Professor Rice's op-ed titled, America's Real Moral Crisis. And to quote Professor Rice, the real moral crisis in America today has nothing to do with private morality. The real crisis involves public morality. Consider these examples. Several Republican members of the House of Representatives appears to have helped plan the January 6th insurrection. Consider that, members of Congress, elected officials, participating in a mob insurrection on the nation's capital, sacred space. Top executives, executives of Facebook, and I might add other media companies, have knowingly fomented divisiveness and hate in order to sell more ads. The more hate, the more vitriol, the more clicks, the more money that's made. Most Republican lawmakers continue to put their party and their careers ahead of the American democracy by accepting Donald Trump's baseless claim that the 2020 presidential election was stolen from him. In other words, perpetuating the big lie. State lawmakers around the country are passing laws to suppress the vote of likely Democratic voters and are forbidding teachers to tell their students about America's history of racism. The so-called critical race theory has become a rallying cry for conservative pundits and community activists. If Professor Reich's arguments do not persuade you of America's moral decay, maybe in the following will help. Those elected officials, many of whom are now working with parent groups, demanding that communities forego science-based strategies to control the COVID spread, to satisfy their own political agenda, no mask, no mandate. And it's just curious to me that those individuals who work with our most vulnerable citizens, healthcare individuals, law enforcement, others who are spending their time with little children and older people are deciding not to get vaccinated. They are allowing their cultural identity and their political agendas to, to, to take advantage of and to trump science. And this doesn't mean to you that we're dealing with moral decay? I believe that it should. The wages of the middle class, for instance, middle class workers, have their wages have not gone up in decades. Systematic racism is part of the everyday life of most people of color. Indeed, we are dealing with a collective moral decay that we have not known before. I know some of you may believe that this is no place in a sermon, but I can tell you, the pastor's call, the preacher's call to preach truth to power. Is it not for us to stand in the gap and say what thus saith the Lord, regardless of the circumstance or the situation? My political affiliations aren't relevant, but I have to call out the lie when it is told. In our local communities, we're witnessing a rapid decline in our common decency and moral standards that is trending along with the national scene. Yes. Every day we are witnessing horrific acts of violence, sexual assaults on public transit vehicles filled with passengers. Wow. Wow. Babies and mothers are being killed for no other reason than they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Poor people are being priced out of communities that they once called home for generations. Wow. For instance, University City townhomes at 40th and Market Street right here in Philadelphia. It's been the home of more modern income families for over 40 years. The developer has now decided he no longer wants to rent to low modern income people. He will sell the property to the highest bidder, thus ending the presence of those individuals in this community. No, the pandemic has exposed what is an operating outside of the public consciousness for decades. Yeah. It did not cause these issues. The pandemic is not the author of income inequality. It is not the author of hate and racism. It is not the author of selfishness and indignity. It is not the author. It merely pulled back the covers to allow those things to flourish. Yeah. 
it promoted those hate speeches by elected officials who are pandering to the extremes in order to get reelected. Wow. So how do we respond? What do we do in the midst of all that's going on around us? In the midst of this moral decay, what do we do when it appears that we're walking deeper and deeper in quicksand and that we don't seem to be making any progress? How do we hold ourselves accountable for the state of our communities in our country? Well, Psalms 21 says to us, I looked up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. My help comes from the Lord. Well, these scriptures here, this text here that we're using in Micah, the sixth chapter, also helps give us some direction. Micah is one of the 12 of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. The prophet Micah comes from the city of Morseth, which is near Gath, about 30 miles from Jerusalem. He was a contemporary of Isaiah. Micah describes not only what God is like, but how people can be God-like. The prophet Micah has in view both the Assyrian and Babylonian invasions. Micah sees a vivid picture of destruction that will come about of the people beginning with their rulers and spreading throughout the community. No one would be served. There was corruption, oppression, bribery, and injustice. And the people were not able to see that something gone, had gone radically wrong. God rebuked those who used their social or political power for personal gain at the expense of others. Wow. Judgment was coming because the people of God were no longer living as the people of God. That sound familiar? Yeah. The poor being exploited. Yeah. The norm, the lies and the abstractions become the norm. Yeah. Alternative facts become the reality. God's people were no longer living as God's people. In its seventh chapter, Micah provides a comprehensive look at God's complex relationship with Israel. Yeah. God's anger, God's frustration, God's judgment is on full display. As well as God's compassion. And God's offer, his extended hand of healing and restoration. But we're living in a difficult time. Today, we're living in dark times. Micah, this text in Micah is about lifestyle, not self-righteousness. Wow. Wow. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So how do we respond to this season of moral decay wow. that is happening all around us? But God's response to Israel <clears throat> works for the 21st century. This New Testament church, this Old Testament prophet has a word to share with us. He has told you, O mortal, what is good yeah. and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. To do justice, to love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. It is interesting to me that the first two things that are noted in uh, the 6th chapter, 8th verse, are action items. The first two things are things that do not relate to God. Yeah. They're items that relate to how we treat God's creation. Mm -hmm. Do justice. Which means that we must actively take action to ensure that others are being treated justly. It isn't praying for someone to be treated justly. It isn't being, being thoughtful about somebody who's not being treated properly. It's actively taking a role in making certain yeah. that people are being treated justly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Changing systems as they currently exist. Working in the situations that you see every day. Free. The weak, the powerless, the poor, the migrant, the immigrant, all those who do not look like us, who do not talk like us, or may not even worship like us. Mm. If they are hungry, we must feed them. If they're naked, we need to show mercy towards them. Forgive their transitions. Not seek, encourage, pray for justice, but to do justice. Yeah. Take an action. We must actively work on justice. Act justice. Integrity. Act justly righteousness. Integrity. Uprightness. Morally right. Those are things that represent this action that we must take. Yeah. Doing the right thing in every situation at all times. Doing the right thing. That's what it means to do justice. Sitting on the sidelines is no longer an acceptable position. Wow. 
We can't sit and watch. We can't tell someone else to do it. We can't send in an anonymous letter to the church past and say the church ought to be out there doing something. We can't call to the politician and say, I elected you, now go fix this problem. It is our problem. Yeah. It is our issue. Justice must be part of what we do on a daily basis. Doing justice. But we also must love kindness. Yeah. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious. Love is not arrogant or rude. Love never ends. But we want to take that love and marry it with kindness. Webster's Dictionary defines kindness as a noun. It is the quality of being kind or of goodwill. Yeah. According to the commentary writers, can't Kindness translates a Hebrew word hesed, a word that is difficult to translate into English. It has to do with love, loyalty, faithfulness, and is used to describe the key element in relationships. Wow. Relationships. God built us for relationships. And so that one of the reasons that we develop and we can develop relationships is when we commit ourselves to loving kindness towards others. That's what this church is all about. Yeah. One of the things that I miss most is the fact that I haven't been able to hug anybody. I haven't been able to be in the same space just to say a kind word or hear a kind word. That's what relationships will do for you. Has said this, this, this word has said has been demonstrated in the book of Ruth. You know, Ruth, you know, Ruth, Ruth, Ruth was a widow. She was a widow. Her husband died, but more importantly, her sisters-in-law, her brothers-in-law also died. So her sisters-in-law were also widows. And their mother-in-law was a widow. And the mother-in-law asked Naomi, asked them to leave and to go back to their homes now that their husbands were died, had, had died. And Ruth decided that she was so committed to Naomi that she would not leave her side. She gave up her family. She gave up her country. She gave up her religion. She joined with Naomi. And decided wherever Naomi goes, she was going. That's commitment to relationship. That's commitment to kindness. That's going to be up and above and beyond all that is required of you. She did the exact opposite of what the cultural context would have suggested she should do. That says to me that we can't go along just to get along. Right, right. Just because everybody else does it that way doesn't mean that you need to be that person. Even when you're going against the tide, you need to say, no, this is wrong. And stand with the might of God and say and proclaim this is wrong. Yeah. And be willing to do whatever is necessary to right that wrong. A kind word, a small kind act are the building blocks of strong relationships. Chesed is wrapping up itself all the positive attributes of God. Wow. Love, covenant, faithfulness, mercy, grace, kindness, loyalty. In short order. Those things are so important. You know, one of the things that I just wanted to pause for a minute, Pastor. Several weeks ago, when you were in the office, I got a, a package. And that package contained a really interesting item. Before I get there, though, I just want to share with you. During this pandemic experience, one of the things that has happened, I've received a number of cards and notes from members encouraging me, uh, encouraging us to continue to do what we're doing and to share with us their reactions to the sermons. I've gotten phone calls uh, from members who've decided they needed to call and critique when I preach. Praise God. That's good. But what's been happening is that I really appreciate the fact that you reached out to me. Yeah. The, the fact that you sent a card, that you sat down and wrote my name on an envelope. It's being kind. It's being kind. Well, that package that came in the mail that was left off at the church, Pastor, was this. It contained this ink pen. Now, I won't tell you who gave it to me, but I will tell you that it has written on it, Faithful Servant. My God. It doesn't appear to be an incredibly expensive pen. Not sure where it was purchased or how much it was paid, but I can tell you that this pen is incredibly valuable. And is it valuable not because of the material price that's placed on it? It's valuable because of the meaning that it embodies. Yeah. Every time I pick this pen up, it reminds me of the kindness of a good member. Good it reminds me how they thought so much of me to say something to me. Within their resources, they carved out an amount to purchase a pen for me. Wow. And to leave it for me with a note and a card. 
a note in the card that encouraged me to keep doing what I'm doing. Because when you're preaching to an empty church, Pastor, we don't always know what we're doing is what we ought to be doing. <laughs> and so we will continue to do this. But thank you so much. You blessed my soul. And this pen is now part of my regular rotation. And I will keep it in a safe place. But I wanted to share with you today that this act of kindness, this small act of kindness spoke volumes to my heart. Doing that for someone else. Walking next door with a warm plate of food for someone who's been locked down. Even if you can't go in, hand it to them and walk away. Send somebody a dollar. If you only have five, send them a dollar. You may not have lots of money. You may not have lots of resources. But you can call someone and have prayer with them. You can just talk to them over the fence. Say hello to people who are walking down the street. Smile at someone. Let them know that you are sharing their space. And that you are concerned about their presence. That's so important. Take the time to yeah. take the time. Yeah, yeah. Take the time to take the time. To love kindness is to embrace kindness. Kindness ought to be at the center of your core as an individual. Yeah. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly with your God. The commentary scholars have suggested that this word humbly might better be understood as carefully or circumspectly. The key word is walk. Said another way, it is to say, is to walk or travel with God circumspectly. Yeah. Traveling according to God's will, not our will. Luke tells us that yet not my will, but yours be done, O Lord. The Lord's will will be done. Walk humbly with your God. Humble is, of course, the opposite of proud. Yeah. Humility tells me that I'm created. Humility tells me I, I cannot save myself. Humility tells me I need a creator and a redeemer. It is a sense of my need for God. My de dependence on God. What I am and who I am before God of the universe. Second Chronicles tells us that it's my people who are called by my name, humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. This time of moral decay suggests that we ought to be on our knees praying to God, seeking him, asking him, pleading with him to be part of the solution. Walk humbly with your God. Walking like you know that God's in charge. Yeah. Walking as if there's no other way for you to go but with God. That's what it suggests to me. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk uply, humbly with your God. Pastor, one of the things that bothers me as I sat and I read and I wrote down for this sermon those horrific acts of violence that we've had, we've witnessed over the last several months and years. Though these murders and sexual assaults that are occurring during the normal course of an ordinary day. The problem that concerns me is that these things in not so distant past would not have occurred during the day. Right, right, right. These things would have occurred at night in some seedy location or some disreputable organization or by individuals we know to be known gangsters. But these things are happening during the normal course of business. People are being shot on 52nd Street or downtown on Broad Street in the middle of the day. Wow. Sitting at an intersection on your lunch break, you can be shot and killed. But the thing that upsets me most is the pattern around these events is always the same. Wow. Bad things happen. Press conferences call. Yep. The police, elected officials, family members who are distraught, emotionally distraught. They all show up and they stand before the cameras. And they plead, somebody do something in their desperation. Somebody must do something to change this. Somebody's got to make this different. Bad things happen. A rally is called. Press conference is organized. Somebody must do something. Bad things happen. Yeah. Press conference is called. We rally around. We bring balloons. We drop off stuffed animals. Somebody must do something. Pastor, the thing that bothers me is this. That somebody, it's got to be us. Free. 
It got to be me. It's got to be you. It's got to be all of us. That somebody is us. Yeah. Screaming into the night helps you deal with your emotion at the moment. It doesn't solve the problem. Free. The work has to be done behind closed doors. The work has to be done with that four-year-old, that five-year-old, that six-year-old. The work has to be done with that teenager who's out of control. The work has to be done, fathers, for that child that you haven't spoken to since he was born. The work has to be done in how you live your life. The example you're setting for your children. The work has to be done with your neighbor's child. The work has to be done with your extended family. Reach out, show kindness, show love. Do justice within your own family. Yeah. Work has to be done. We have to do the work. Pastor, some, back in September, you began a series of sermons that were dangerous. You challenged us in ways that we hadn't considered before. Pastor, you, you, you took, made us take a critical look at how we were approaching our lives. Serving sermons that focused on self-care with titles such as Thinking Through Your Choices. Costly decisions. Thinking it through protecting your peace. We were challenged to do the hard work of self-introspection and then taking course correction. Hard work, but necessary work. But that work, as hard as it was and hard as it is, for those of us who have begun the process of re charting our lives who are beginning to struggle with who we are who are coming to terms with the issues that we brought on ourselves in the midst of all of that we still have to contend with what the Lord says for us how do we do that how do we connect that it isn't just about us because our work as good as it is and as hard as it is will be incomplete unless we figure out how to intentionally and purposefully connect with God yeah if our relationship with the Lord is not enhanced, all of that work will be for naught. A meaningful change in your relationship with God will lead to a change in your behavior. It will mean a radical change in your life. God may be calling you to take your life in a completely new direction. It could be he's calling you to evangelize. He may be calling on you just to be a bit more patient, to show a little more grace to your neighbor. He may be calling on you to take on a new business venture, to take on a different career that requires less stress and more benefits, Free. that provides a better way for your family to love you and for you to love them. He may be challenging you to a deeper commitment to your community and to service in your community. But all in all, God is challenging us. He's calling us to do justice, to love kindly, kindness, to walk humbly with him, to link arms with him. So that we might bring healing to our communities in this country. I am convinced that we cannot, that we will not be able to stop the decay unless we connect with God. Free. Unless we begin to link our arms with his arm. But God in his wisdom is not demanding that we double our ties at the church. He's not asking that we spend more time at corporate worship. God is not demanding any external forms of religion. More church is not what's required. Look around. Almost every corner of this West Philadelphia community has a church. And in some cases, there are two or three churches doing a whole block. So God is not asking that of us. God is just asking us in our own space where we live every day, where we walk and live and have our being to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with him. To walk under God's grace. To walk under God's power. So as we struggle through this season. And this is a season. This is not our eternity. Free. This is just a season. As bad as it is. This is just a season. My desire is that. And prayer is that we walk with the Lord. Into our best life. Okay. That we take the Lord's hand. And he takes our hand. And we walk with the Lord. And the direction that he leads. Yeah. You know, there's an old Negro spiritual that says, walk with me, Lord, walk with me. Lord, take my hand. Lord, take my hand. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord, as I walk along this pilgrim's journey. Yeah. I need you, Lord. Yeah. Walk with me. Be my friend. Walk with me. Walk with me, Lord. Walk with me. 
Lord, be my friend. Take my hand. Lead me on. Help me, Lord. Bless me that I might bless others. Bless me that I might be the solution to this problem that's in my community. Bless me, Lord, that I may have the strength, the power to do justice. Lord, to love kindness and the wisdom to walk humbly with you. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. Beloved, the doors of the church are open for some man, some woman, some boy, some girl. You you tuned in today trying to figure out what was next in your life. And the preacher stopped by on his way to heaven to let you know that there are some things that you should consider while you're considering your life. One of the things you need to consider is what does the Lord require of you? Not what the Lord requires of your neighbor. Not even what the Lord requires of the pastor. The preacher said, what does the Lord require of you? Hmm. Only you could answer that question. And one of the things that the Lord required was that you walk humbly with your God. Now, the doors of the church are open and invitation is extended for you to be able to walk with God, walk with God in a new way, walk with God in a more exciting way. But in order for you to walk with God, you're going to have to put one foot in front of the other. So why don't you come? Today you hear my voice, harden not your heart. This is your day. This is your opportunity to do something new in your life. You could do a new thing in your life by walking with God. Why don't you allow the power of Jesus Christ to to, to give you what you need by walking with God in a new way, in a new time, in a new season in your life. If you want to see things differently in your life, I dare you to take God at God's word and walk with God today. Is there one? Is there one? Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promissory note. All you have is today. Why don't you come? There's a number of ways you can join. You could leave a comment on Facebook. You can leave a comment on YouTube. You can email the church. You can call the church. Whatever you need to do to get here, you're just a family member that we've not met yet. Why don't you come? Is there one? You may not be looking to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You may be in need of a church home. I'm telling you, I can't think of no better place than Mount Carmel Baptist Church. We've been on pause a little bit because of the pandemic, but as we prepare to move back into the swing of things, I'm telling you, you can't find no better church than Mount Carmel Baptist Church. A church that will walk with you, a church that will talk with you. When everybody else has left you and only talking about you, why don't you come? Is there one? Is there one? God bless you. Heaven smile upon you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his counsels upon you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen.